If you enjoy the channel and our video content and would like to support us, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can sign up to our Patreon site which is a monthly subscription to one of our four tiers, each giving you something different from early access interviews up to exclusive unseen footage. There's also the option of a one-off donation via PayPal which allows you the option to donate an amount of your choice. Both options really help to keep this channel going and to continue putting out regular content for you good folk. So please take a look at aircurrentreview.tv forward slash donate and I thank you in advance. Thank you and enjoy. We are back with a legend that is nasty and we've got a great episode for you guys today. We're here to talk about my favourite subject and I'm sure yours, DACT or BFM and Nasty, I want to know what the F-14 was like to fly against, let's say the F-15, F-16 and F-18. Hey Mike, thanks. It's great to be back with you. And it cracks me up every time you say the legend that's nasty. It's like, you know, it's just funny to, to hear me listen. So, uh, so yeah, so dissimilar air combat training, DAC, or basic fighter maneuvering. And so if your audience thinks about this, when we talk about different sorts of airplanes, you know, dissimilar air combat training means I'm going to train against an airplane different than the one I'm flying. And so in this case today, I did I did have a chance. So I have 3,000 hours in, in F-14, uh, 2,500 in F-14A that had different engines than the F-14D. In the F-14D, that had F-110 engines, which is essentially the same as in an F-16, the later models of the F-16. And the power of those engines in the D was such that at military power, that is non-augmenter or non-afterburning, the the F uh, the F-14D engines had basically more power than the F-14A with those Pratt and Whitney engines in full afterburn. So you had extra amount. So I had 2,500 hours in F-14A, and then I go to fly the D for the other 500 hours, and I now have a Tomcat that's like a kick in the ass. You know, now when I go into afterburner, it's it's a regime of power and maneuvering I never had in 2,500 hours of flying Tomcats. So it's kind of like stepping into a different airplane, but with the same maneuvering characteristics. And so, for instance, for your listeners, and this is basic stuff, in order to fly, you know, basic fighter maneuvers, so BFM is not this. BFM is basic fighter maneuver. So the way you with the way you fly the airplanes, so all your guests that have flown, they know how to do BFM in their airplane. Mm. Dissimilar air combat training is to fight a different airplane. Dissimilar meaning I'm in a Tomcat, that other guy is in an F-15, an F-16, or an F-18. Okay, so when I go go fly as so so things like in the in the Tomcat that was most cool was. Uh, you could go up over the top in a loop in an F-14D at 220 knots. And so in a lot of the dissimilar air combat training we do, the ability to fly slow is is one of the, the uh, distinguishing factors of a really good fighter. And you've seen, we've all seen the tapes of F-22 and Russian Cobra maneuvers, that that sort of an airplane hanging kind of like this on its engines, just kind of pointing around. That's what I'm talking about. Because eventually every fight, unless you get down on the ground and somebody runs into the ground, every fight devolves into a slow fight. Right. Always. One circle or two circle, wherever you're going, you get in close and you're, you're maneuvering hard, you're depleting energy, you eventually get into a slow fight. And so the ability of, to maneuver slow is huge. And so in the F-14A, Usually about 325 knots, 350 knots, you, you, you can go over the top or, or the loop. We call it going over the top. Some people say go vertical, but going over the top means the ability to come into a loop and extend away from the bad guy in the vertical. Mm. So in the D, 220 knots. Now you're slow. Now you're down there going around a circle like this. I, you know, I'll do this with the, you know, you're, you're like, you know, and, and the airplane's shaking like that. And you go around a circle. Pretty soon you're pretty slow. In the F-14, down slow, you could go into full afterburner, and usually weren't full afterburner, unload the G for like one potato, two potato, real quick, and then you could go over the top. And that was the distinguishing factor in the D. Okay, so I did get an opportunity to fight. I also flew the F-18. Uh, I have about 500 hours in the F-18. 
the distinguishing factor of the F-18 Super Hornet, not, not the Charlie, but the Super Hornet, was that it has software that helps you fly slow. Okay, again, we're talking about basic fighter maneuvers, not dissimilar combat training. So in the Tomcat, when I push on the rudders or I push on the stick, they're connected through hydraulic actuators to the rudders and the spoilers and the differential tails in the airplane. So you put a control input into an F-14, you're doing it. In this Super Hornet, if I'm down slow and I should be using the rudders to move the airplane around, because if you, if you try to use ailerons uh, in, 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 a, in a normal airplane, you'll get, you'll get roll off. The airplane will go the way you don't want it to go. You need to, excuse me, you need to use rudders down slow at high angles of attack. And so any airplane out there is mechanically driven, so the, the flight controls, and you're down slow at high angle of attack, it could be a Cessna 152, it could be an executive jet, and it could be a fighter. When you're down at high angle of attack, close, close to slow, you need to be dancing on the rudders in a, in a normally configured airplane. In a software configured airplane or a fly-by-wire airplane, like in the Super Hornet, if we get down slow and I'm in a, in a flat scissors with somebody where now we're going trying to get to each other's tail to fly as slow as possible. So, so this way, I'm trying to fly as slow as possible there that way so that the, the, the guy goes out in front of me and then I can dump the nose and shoot him. You are on the rudders dancing in the Tomcat. In the Super Hornet, you move the stick and the computer says, oh, you rudder because we're slow and the rudders would move mm -hmm. even when moving the stick because it's all connected okay so um, any fly-by-wire airplane is set up that way all right so when i went to fly the super hornet the ability to fly slow is really really good because even real slow the airplane would do everything possible um, to to stay nose high and to be able to maneuver even though you're falling out of the sky and so in a tomcat you're, you fall, you go like this, and you're you're installed. And you're like, I got to get the shot, and then and it falls out. And now you're you're out of control, and thing falls off. And you know, if you get like that and go kind of ballistic, which is called when you're just a falling piece of metal, you're going to get shot at. You know, so if you if you don't don't control your airplane and you fall off, you're going to get shot at. And and so you got to maintain. You know, you're right there on the edge of stall, trying to get slow so you can shoot this guy. And a, a fly by wire airplane like a, like a Super Hornet, you're falling like a rock you're able to point because of the because of the software fly by wire airplanes so new f-15 ex digital airplane it's going to fly like that and it's got really powerful engines so it's going to be able to kind of hang on its tail and be able to point around you've seen f-22s do this that's why okay so in a dissimilar air combat training environment when you're fighting something like an f-18 an f-16 or an f-15 it is a tough tough fight for an f-14 tough fight that's when you have to be your very best airplane mm. um the advantages of of the f-14d because that was the last one that was flying is that thrust that acceleration uh, obviously this is all visual now we got a gun we got a uh, we got a heat missile and the benefits of the current heat seeking missile are they're tied there's an aim 9x for instance and there are other uh, missiles out there like the python um there's there's another one uh, I, I lost it right now uh, it's a it's a British version of a heat seeking missile, but they're tied to your helmet now, and the and the helmet mounted cueing systems we have in the modern airplanes, you now can look anywhere. So you can look you can look backwards, and you shoot the trigger, and the missile will come off and go to where your helmet's looking. And before there used to be an envelope kind of out in front of your airplane, and sometimes in the very advanced missiles they were they were out you know kind of out like this like peripheral vision, out here, but in the forward quarter. And so the game changer was you're fighting somebody looking over your shoulder and you you could look back at that guy and shoot him when he's behind you. Um, so it's, it's almost not fair. <laughs> so so there's when you get in and do DACT, dissimilar combat training, when, when it's called going to the merge, when you merge with somebody, that's the merge. That's a very dangerous place to be if you're fighting for your life. Um, of course, in fun, when you're fighting, you know, your buddies or whatever, that's really fun. And there's nothing more exhilarating than flying by somebody at 500 feet or a slightly bit closer. But the 500 <laughs> foot bubble is between the two for safety. And every once in a while, we dust somebody off. Um, and so so you, you want to take every advantage. And by the way, let me let me pause for a second for your listeners. When we look at DACT and, you know, when people are using the, the simulators and looking out there 
there, you know, and we're watching the maneuvering and you're doing the computer thing. You are not even close in the environment that, that dissimilar air combat training is. It's hard. I mean, it's like a varsity sport. You're pulling G, you're looking over. My neck still hurts, you know, this many years later from, from being under six and a half or seven and a half Gs in a Super Hornet and turning my head to look here all the way back here like that because you can't let off the G. And, and so, you know, when you're trying to look back through the tails – and you're, you got your, you turn all the way around. And the way you do it in the cockpit is you actually get away from the seat by pushing off the cockpit uh, or the canopy. And, and so I'll put my hand right on the edge of the screen. And you're pushing off real hard. And you're rolling your shoulders out from the seat. And then you're turning your shoulders like this. So using your core to turn mm. and you can't ease the G. So this is under six and a half, seven and a half G's and F-16, nine G's. You know, so you're under G where your hand weighs you know, the amount of G, so eight times, six and a half times more than it normally weighs in gravity. Your head is, is eight pounds. So eight yeah. times, you know, nine, your, your, your head weighs 72 pounds under nine Gs. So you're moving your head and your neck trying to look. And it's, it is, it's hard. And so when you're defensive, it sucks being defensive because you're looking over your shoulder and you're racing around, you're pushing off from the canopy. So it is, it's really hard to be able to see what the other airplane is doing. So the environment is really tough. Okay, so maneuvers. Um, uh, in in fighting the the uh, the F eighteen, really 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 well at at all altitudes, down low, up high. The Tomcat was really good down low, really good. And of course, the swing wing allows you to go you know Mach two, and then and then as you pull on the G or slow down, the air data computer would come out and the wings would come out and give you give you that 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 flat wing. Uh, 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 a straight wing, less wing sweep is good for turning. Um, a more swept back uh, wing sweep or, a, or a, a more narrow wing is good for speed, right? So the Tomcat was optimized to be a, an interceptor, a high altitude, high speed interceptor. And so it could go fast really well, shoot long range. When you get into a fight, so um, the first, first times I, I flew and, and fought against F-15s, I was in an F-14A. And the F-15 wants to keep you high. His, his wing is optimized for being up high. So turning fight, as one of your previous, previous guests talked about, it's a two-circle fight. So it's, a, it's what's called a rate fight. Your turn rate. How, how fast the, the nose is tracking across the horizon. And it's not turn rate like how small. So A-4s and airplanes like that, they, they turn little tiny circles. That's called a radius fight. My radius in the circle is smaller than yours. Here's your radius. I can obviously turn inside you. That's a radius fight. The Tomcat was optimized for a rate fight. The F-18 and F-15 are optimized for a rate fight. We'll set aside F-16 for a second. Um, F-18, F-15, F-14 optimized for a rate fight. So in dissimilar air combat training, when you get to the merge and you realize that's an F-15 or that's an F-18, I'm going to do a rate fight. I'm going into a two-circle fight. Okay, so basically you're turning a, a, away from the guy as he goes around this way. He might redefine that fight. He might turn towards you, and now you're in a one circle. The next time you pass while gaining angles on him, you want to redefine that fight and turn away. But it's a it looks like a figure eight when you draw both airplanes. Okay, and that's because you're optimizing the, the ability of the turn rate of the Tomcat. And so – the Tomcat best rate, you know, is about five to 10 degrees nose down, full afterburner, six and a half Gs, which was the, the maximum G for the airframe. It's called limited by airframe, LBA. So 6.5 G LBA. The Super Hornet, 7.5 G LBA, limited by airframe. Obviously, I can't remember what the F-15 is, might be 7.5. The F-16 is 9 G LBA. OK, but the Tomcat, so your best turn. And by the way, you do this without looking inside. And so what I, when I would train people to fly Tomcats, I train them to fly about 325 knots, about five to 10 degrees nose down, full afterburner, six and a half G. And you feel the airplane doing that, that shake. I mean, it had a shutter. And so I say, hey, you feel that? You feel that? Shut? That's where you are. So now when you're looking over your shoulder that way, you don't have to look inside except for a quick check and see where your airspeed is real fast. And, and you can see it. And right about 300 to 325, you're watching the airspeed indicator and, and you keep the G on. But if you want to get gain a little airspeed, you put the nose down a little bit and the, and the plane accelerates. If you want to lose a little airspeed, you kind of roll away and put up a little bit and you lose. 
When you lose that airspeed, you're also, because you're lessening your speed, you're minimizing your turn radius as well, even though you're maximizing it for rate. So the slower you go, obviously the turn radius is smaller. But you're not rating through, in, in a Tomcat, you're not rating through the air to maximize your ability for turn rate. Hmm. F-15 wants to keep you high. His wing is optimized up there. And so what I would try to do is drag the F-15 down low. That down at five feet over the ground, the Tomcat with its big wing and afterburner, especially the D, is a better airplane. Now, hmm. that's F-15 A's and C's back in the day. When I was uh, stationed at NAS Oceana, we would fight the Langley F-15s all the time. And most of those guys come, ah, Tomcat's a grape, it's all good, until they met a, met a D. Mm. And I would fight a one-circle fight against an F-15, a one-circle fight, a radius fight. Because we'd get to that merge, and I'd go one circle and dig really hard, nose down in, with those big F-110s. And I could really honk on the G and start to point at them pretty fast. It surprised a lot of guys. Wow. And so, uh, and so, oh, okay. And then once they figure that out, that the D is a really, really maneuverable airplane. Now, now we kind of, now they're redefining the fight into a two circle as best they could. So F-14A against an F-15, you're not going to do so well. Now you're flying airplane, hope that guy makes a mistake. And then, and then F F-14D versus an F-15C, really, really a good fight. Of course, the BVR, Beyond Visual Range Weapons, are good. Anybody with a helmet and AIM-9X is good. You know, you can look across a circle and shoot the guy. So generally, when we do dissimilar air combat training like that, we just we we validate the shot. Every, you need to train to every weapon you have. You want to train to that AIM-9X shot where you can get it, look over there, shoot them, you know, get a radar lock or get a helmet lock. You need to have a radar lock to get to slave the or a helmet lock and then skew the weapon over to the helmet. You need to have a lock to do that. So we would train to those, but generally just, hey, good shot, you know, Fox Fox, uh, Fox 2, continue, you know, because you, you just try to do the gun thing, get into a gun solution, which is real pure uh, basic fighter maneuvering towards a dissimilar air combat solution, right? So most times, uh, and for your for your listeners, when we have brief um, heat-seeking missiles and guns, we called it stick, sticks and stones. <laughs> And so we'd go, hey, sticks and stones today. And everybody knows what that is. All right, sticks and stones, guns and, and rear quarter heater shots or or uh, or, or heat-seeking missile shots. So, so F-15 is like that. F-18, uh, same thing. When you find an F-18 in a Tomcat, that F-18 wants to get slow. He's going to drag it out to a one-circle fight so that you're pulling hard one circle. The optimum fight is a two-circle for both airplanes. He's going to drag you down to one circle so he's going to get you slow and then – the Tomcat is going to be less maneuverable down slow because of the controls and the flyby wire. You got to be a really good pilot with really good rudder skills in a Tomcat. And the Super Hornet, he can he can use that flyby wire and just kind of you know turn around right here. And so generally fly slower um, and and um, and and it op operate inside of where the Tomcat is. I had it my uh, one of my final flights. No, with my my final flight on Nimitz, I was. I was fighting the Air Wing Commander, Trim Downing, very, very good fighter pilot, Tomcat guy, F-18C guy, Super Hornet guy. And so I'm fighting him in two F-18 uh, F Super Hornets, both E models off the ship. So we get down flying slow because that's what you do. You get in there and pull real hard after a couple of turns. Now we're flying slow. And I'm, I think I'm doing really, really, really well at 120 knots. He's at 40, 40 knots. <laughs> Okay, and he's just falling out of the sky. He's at 40 knots, and I, I don't even know how to fly the airplane to 40 knots, and he, he is shooting me all day long. So you can get in there and fly really slow with, with those airplanes. Okay, so let's, let's take us to the F-16. The F-16 is the world's best pure fighter aircraft, pure fighter. It has good capabilities. Uh, you know, it can drop bombs and, and attack, and, of course, it goes really fast. Um, it has great air to air capabilities. But when you get down to fighting, if you were to ask me, hey, if you if you were good in an F-14, an F-15, an F-18, an F-16, and you were down in the visual arena, what would you want to have? F-16 all day long. Um, one, because of fly-by-wire. Two, because it goes really fast. Three, it's got 9G capability. Yeah. And that 9G capability allows you to just turn that thing inside its own butt. I mean, it just turns. Um, um and what used to happen, so I fought the Top Gun F-16s out at Miramar, 
uh, I have fought uh, fleet F-16s all loaded up, you know, with tanks and everything else, which they, they are grapes when they're like that. But a purely clean F-16, um, especially with, a, with an AIM-9X or other advanced heat-seeking missile on it, is, is badass. And so what you would do is you get in a fight with F-16, you're already going fast. He's going to do a two-circle or a one-circle fight. He's going to turn across your tail. And, and by the way, we tried to get as many angles as we could. So every time you pass the airplane, uh, the other airplane, you're, you're, you're pulling to get some kind of angle. So what I used to do is right before the merge, right before you start to pull in whatever direction you want, and you start to gain those angles. Even the smallest bit of angle gaining is what you want to do. So you're pulling hard to get that angle on somebody. And oftentimes I would, as long as the, the bad guy didn't disappear, appear belly before we even merge i'd be turning okay so you just want to make sure you're watching him because if you're trying to do a two if you think you're doing a two circle fight you know you turn across his tail and 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 he reverses and you don't see him reverse now he might after turning later he might come inside your turn in a one circle fight so Mm -hmm. you have to watch him but you want to gain those angles early and every time you merge you want to keep gaining those angles a lot of fights with the angles gained and then the, the bad guy will take them away and, and you do the pass. So there's no lateral separation. So as close as you can and, it, and they'll be neutral again. So a really good fight. All the passes are neutral because every the, the, everybody in the airplanes is regaining their, you know, whatever advantage the bad guy had to take it away. You yank real hard and then let go right as you go by him and you, and you get those G there. So what would happen in the. Uh, in the F-16s, and I talked to pilots who flew them all the time uh, as adversary aircraft, they'd go to the merge and they'd just go, they pull the nine Gs, you know, count count one potato, three potato, you know, whatever, and then they let go, and there's the other airplane. The thing would just disappear. We called it a vapor ball. Wow. It would just do a vapor ball. It would just disappear. Big cloud of whoop like that, and now the guy's, he's pointed at you. He's like, right, you just did this turn. You went 180 out with him. And you're coming around the corner looking at him, and he's pointed right at you. And it's, okay, can't do anything about that. <laughs> uh, but the one thing the F-16 has that is a degrader is called an AOA limiter. And it, it doesn't allow – and I don't fly the F-16, so I don't know exactly how it's mechanized or, or why it's there. But it limits the angle of attack. It'll actually – you know, not a G limiter, but the angle of attack on the airplane – and if the pilot hits the AOA limiter, he's pulling hard, he's doing something with his throttles, and he hits that limiter, the airplane would just stop turning. Mm. And it just arcs. And that happened to me one time in a Top Gun fight. Um, when I was a Top Gun student in 1985, I fought an F-16, and I was fighting hard, and I got some angles on him in an F-14A, and I'm coming out, and he's pulling hard. And all of a sudden, it's just like he let go. The airplane's pulling hard, it's turning, and you can see the airplane nose coming across. When you're fighting somebody, you can see them tracking, and you can evaluate their nose. You can see where the nose is moving. It's coming at you. It's good. It's away. I mean, you can um, evaluating the, the nose attitude of the other airplane is absolutely critical in a fight. And and he's, he's all right, we're over the desert out of near Yuma, Arizona. He's tracking across the desert. I can still see it, and, and I'm... Kind of, inter- kind of gaining on him a little bit. And all of a sudden, his airplane just stops turning and it just arcs. Mm. And so if you were arcing through the sky, that's bad. Because now you're just turning and it's easy to see where you're going to go and you're going to get shot. And I'm pulling hard. And all of a sudden, you just, it, 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 the airplane like, dunk, dunk, and it just starts arcing like that, which allowed me to pull inside the turn and, and shoot it. And it was a, it was a gunshot. And I, I knew about the limiter. And I was like, oh, that's what it looks like. And so fighting an F-16, if he gets on the limiter or he allows himself to get on the limiter and, and the, the pilot made a mistake and he was pulling too hard with maybe he, he modulated the throttle or something. And the AOA was allowed to get to that point where the limiter, um, you know, kicked in. Now what you have to do, if you're in a in a high G situation and you've now buried it into a stall, if you've got an AOA limiter, if you've got anything that has got you below the capability of the airplane, you have to unload the G. You have to let go. And now you you're not turning anymore you have to unload and then hopefully with an airplane like the f-16 or the f-18 f-15 f-14d you unload for a second you're already in full blower full afterburner you know one potato two, and then pull now you're back into it so hopefully it's a little you recover the thrust puts you back in the regime you're supposed to be and then you're right back into the fight mm-hmm. and and that's kind of how you got to do it just like that so um so fighting 
fighting really capable airplanes. And these extend. I've never fought uh, Russian advanced airplanes, uh, MiG-29s or Sukhois. I've never fought those airplanes but i've watched demonstrations of them and they're, they're pretty they're really really good so those fights that are that you learn in america to fight an, an f-15 an f-18 or an f-16 they're going to set you up to be able to fight those those advanced russian airplanes as well most of those airplanes um are are the characteristics that help them a lot are there they are they have a lots of thrust their engines are very 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 powerful so so they got lots of thrust so they'll be able to shoot out of a hole and of course you've, you've seen them do the the Cobra things, and so the ability to slow down and maneuver and basically hang and just sit in there, and all they'll do is point at you. Mm. And so if you're trying to get away, it's like a you know, it's like a dog trying to chase a cat, and the cat sits there with its claws out. The dog can't get close, right? And the dog's trying to race in and get it. Well, that's kind of what it's like, mm. you know. So there's the cat, and he's going to just whack you if you get close enough. So those, those there sit in pirouette and pivot, and they'll just wait till you fly into the weapons envelope or wes. A weapons engagement zone and they'll shoot you and so so they're very very hard fights and so the, what you do with those is once the guy gets slow and he's like that as soon as his nose is off of you you extend out really hard and so you extend away and you and you you do what's called to redefine the fight mm -hmm. so now if you can you know the guy makes a mistake or gets buried or something like that you know and now we're slow if you have the opportunity to add you know add power go back into full afterburner and extend away before his nose comes on. And so when a Tomcat, for instance, backs here, says, all right, I'm extending. Tell me when his nose is 30 degrees to go. So, so the back seater is looking through the tails. Okay, you know, 20 degrees, you know, 90 degrees to go, 60 degrees to go, 50 degrees to go. Okay, pitch back in. Now you're coming back in against this guy, and now you're redefining that fight, and you create another merge. Okay, so you can, you can put energy back on the airplane. The secret to all of these fights is to fly your best airplane, you have to keep energy on your airplane. So that that corner rate turn in a Tomcat 300 to 325 knots, no less than 300 knots, nose down, pulling six and a half Gs. Got to keep the energy on your airplane. If you don't manage your energy right, you're going to lose the fight. Okay, long narrative. I'll pause there, take a breath, see if you got any questions. I mean, yeah, it sounds amazing, but uh, is there one aircraft that uh, was more memorable to fight, even in the uh, ARD, uh, was the one where you're like, the, apart from the F-16, let's take that aside, but there was a, one aircraft you're like, okay, this is kind of fair, but still a difficult fight. F-15. Yep. Right. F-15. And there's a, there's a story in my book, which is really, really, really fun. Uh, Learn how to lead to win. Chapter 18 is called The Cable Guy. And uh, I'll let the readers, uh, you know, get the chapter. But it, it's, it talks about a person I met earlier in my in my life. And a couple, you know, uh, third, third, a little over a decade later, I'm fighting him in an F-15 and I'm in an F-14D. Um, that F-15 is a really, really, really capable airplane. And that's the one you go up against. OK, this is going to this is going to be awesome. It's like, you know, two boxers totally evenly matched. And it literally is I can fly my best F-14 that pilot has to fly his best F-15, and we'll see what happens. And in, in our fights, in this one, you know, uh, uh, described in the book, you know, we did a BVR, Beyond Visual Range Approach, and we went into a merge, you know, from 100 miles away. Went into a merge, full fight, he gunned me. The next fight, we're set up a beam, uh, 15,000 feet, mile of beam, 300 knots, go. I gunned him. And then the third fight was all the way down to the deck, neutral. And mm -hmm. so... I fought a better airplane in the second fight. He fought a better airplane in the first fight. And then and then we tried our hardest on the third fight. Looked a lot like the Top Gun 2 movie, but not as close with the oh, yeah. spiral on the third fight going down, kind of looking at each other, right? It wasn't it wasn't like right between me, like me, me and you, but yeah. it was close enough to, you know, go down like this in the other airplane. Like I said, you get slow and you start, you know, when you transition on somebody, your, your nose is down to keep the speed up doing that. And eventually... Because of either the ground itself or the soft deck, eventually both airplanes have to pick their noses up, and then you end up in a, what's called a horizontal or a flat scissors. And now you're slow trying to get behind the other guy like this. And so, yeah, F-15 is is the most memorable fight. I have not uh, gotten a chance to to uh, even experience the F-15 EX. It's a total fly-by-wire airplane, has big engines on it. I, I'm sure that that airplane fights really, really, really well. 
I mean, that's awesome. One thing, it's just a bit of a side note here. So when you were saying you were up with uh, the F-15 like that, did anyone snap any pictures? Because they would have been amazing. You know, like from your cockpit or anyone <laughs> like, that would have been incredible. Uh, yeah, not while we're fighting. Uh, you know, both <clears throat> in a Tomcat, both air crew are, are, you know, fighting hard. And we never went out and went, okay, I'm going to, we're going to do this just to get pictures. There are there are plenty of real life pictures out there. There's some great footage of old old Top Gun fights that you, you see airplanes going by each other. You know, they've got cameras mounted or something like that, or they've got a something in the cockpit. There's a lot of imagery out there actually of real you know real world DACT uh, training just from people taking pictures. But I, I never did. And most of the time you look out there and you can see the whole airplane and stuff. But you take a picture, you got like a picture of the cockpit. You know, yeah. the other guy, right? You only got like this much airplanes. So it's like, ah, oh, okay, well, that doesn't look like what I was looking at, but it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So just uh, one last question here. So you mentioned the F-15. Uh, I'm guessing that was a C version. Did you ever go, go up against a Strike Eagle to ease? Um, if we did, I, I did, but it was in a, a large uh, strike scenario where where now you're, you're it's not just you versus, uh, we call them mud hens. You know, mud, yeah, mud a mud hen, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. mud hen, right? So, so instead of instead of just being right there, one v one, DACT, it was generally a large strike. So you now you're rolling in on somebody, and you you have you, you generally as an adversary have an advantage. So I, I have been an attacking force on on an F fifteen EX strike. Here here's the other thing too. Um, you brought up a great point there, just in me thinking about that. When you're flying in. And, the neutral setup that goes like that in DACT, that's that's to maximize the training capability. But generally, when you're when you're flying into bad guy country, you're looking around and you're you know, and, and the setup is anything but neutral. You're lucky if it goes neutral. Generally, as an as a strike and, and I flew adversary or uh, adversary F-18s um, when I was in my my last couple operational tours. You're down there waiting for the strike to come in. You're down in the weeds looking up at somebody or you're real high. You got radar contact or, or the, the controller saying, hey, here they come. And trying to come from someplace they can't see you. Hmm. So, you know, uh, uh, the Red Baron's kills, vast majority of them, his, his, uh, his kills, they never saw him. He came out of the sun, shot him from behind. You know, it was, there was a lot of maneuvering. And if there was, was maneuvering, um, he he tried to get away, mm-hmm. and so if you're in there doing you know one v one fights in a real world environment, you're not in a good place. That's mm-hmm. not where you want to be. You want to do your best fight for one turn, try to kill that guy, but you're most get away for two reasons. One, if you you know now you're fighting a guy and he shoots you, that's one thing. Or you're totally predictable in a single space. Somebody else is going to shoot you. It might be a surface to air missile. It might be another thing. You don't want to be there. And so most of the really realistic training, not DACT, which is the most fun, that's the most fun. It's just totally fun because you don't have to worry about anything else. You're just going to fight that guy, you know, go by. But most of the realistic training is strike force training. And if you get down and turn in with somebody, all my Top Gun debriefs and large force exercises and strikes, if you're down buried with me, you're going to die. Somebody is going to kill you. And that's generally what happened environment of course that's in real world too so they would they would always train you hey you got buried with you know bogey whatever and his buddy came out and he shot you and and mm-hmm. so you're dead from staying right here so what you want to do is put your best turn on and extend and go away because if you didn't get the bbr first then get out of there and keep going so i want to make sure your listeners understand in real world combat you, you don't want to be there one v one unless you absolutely have to and then you fight your best airplane to, to kill that guy or mostly to get away. Uh, otherwise, your, your odds, the longer you stay right there, the odds of you getting shot go way, way, way up. Yeah. I mean, that was great and a great insight. Then I've learned a lot and I'm sure you guys listen to it have also learned a lot of things there. But uh, cheers for that, Nasty. But uh, yeah, can you remind us where we can find your book? Uh, Learn How to Lead to Win. And also, are you on social media, your website, etc.? Yeah, so thanks, Mike, and it's so cool to be here with you. I think we're going on like our, at least our third time, maybe the fourth. I love talking about this stuff. I get all excited about this. I start yeah, I'm back in too. the cockpit again, and obviously using my hands. And, and by the way, at work, I use my hands too, and they're like, oh, there's nasty again, fire pilot. But, <laughs> but my book is, is sold on Amazon, and I got a surprise. Um, so Learn How to Lead to Win is a leadership book. 
I just released the Manazer Maxims, which is if in the back of um, Learn How to Lead to Win, there are 10 maxims. And, they, and they're like rules that, that I use to lead by. But we took each maxim and made it a chapter. Oh, brilliant. So this companion book to learn how to lead to win um, goes goes with it to to allow, you know, your listeners to to experience and, and maybe even practice the type of leadership that I think is important. Um, Amazon, uh, um, also uh, any of the wholesale uh, books there. I also did an audio book for learn how to lead to win. The Maxims is not audio. Um, it's just coming out in, in paperback. Right now, there's already an e version that are out there, uh, and and my is www.mikemanazer.com, and it has a whole bunch of leadership content. And in fact, specifically, and I think we talked about this last time, if your listeners go on the website www.mikemanazer.com, there's a little button will pop up that says subscribe to a newsletter, and every week um, the subscribers will get a specific leadership newsletter, specific topic, free in an inbox. And we've taken about a hundred leadership topics, which are important to everybody running a business or trying how to lead. And we do a newsletter a week and it shows up in your inbox free. So, um, yeah, website or Amazon for the books. And, uh, I just, uh, I just hope everybody enjoys the, the books and the, the book. So, so if you, if you like fighter stories, there's 33 stories in that book. Most of them are about flying. Some are about driving ships. Uh, there's a lot of mistakes and failure in there. And then, with each chap, with each story, there's a leadership lesson tied to it, and then and then resources that people can go. Hey, I, I like to learn more about that, but from a different author, and we give we give other references for people to go to. Brilliant stuff. So it's got something for everyone, that's for sure. But uh, Nasty, always a pleasure having you on the show. And guys, I'll link everything Nasty just said in the description. But I'm sure we'll meet again. But uh, always a pleasure, Nasty. Hey, thanks, Mike. This has been great. Cheers. <laughs>